I am committed to loving God and loving others. Despite my circumstances, I feel inner contentment and understand my purpose in life. I am free from anxiety because I have found peace with God, peace with others, and peace with myself. I have the power through Christ to control myself. I can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. I am slow to anger and endure patiently under the unavoidable pressures of life. I choose to be kind and good in my relationship with others. I have established a good name with God and others based on my loyalty to those relationships. I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my dealings with others. I choose to esteem others above myself. Good day. <laughs> that will never get old. Hey guys, how are you doing this morning? Doing well? Look, I'm uh, I don't know about you, but I'm so excited to be here and I'm, happy, I'm so excited to, to share with what God has put on my heart. So I just want to start with something a little bit fun. I lo who loves trivia? Yeah, 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 come on. Okay, I've got one trivia question for you, okay? And it's not just any trivia question. It is Australian animal trivia. Whoa, all right. So... Don't call out. There's going to be multiple choice. I'll ask you to put your hands up. Who knows what this bird is? Okay, this is an Australian bird. Is it A, a bunyip? These are real animals, by the way. Is it B, a kookaburra? Or, whoa, all right. C, spoiler, or is it a karawong? All right, so back to the image. So what animal is that? Who thinks it's a bunyip? Who thinks it's a kookaburra? Who thinks it's the other one? <laughs> it's the other one. No, no, it's a kookaburra. It's a, well done, guys. All right, let's pray. No, no. All right, so it's a kookaburra. So the thing with the kookaburra is it has a very, very, very unique sound. It makes this sound in the morning, and in a way, it's like Australia's rooster, okay? So this is exactly what a kookaburra sounds like. <laughs> All right, that's the kookaburra sound. So it sounds like a monkey, but it's actually a bird about this big. So the kookaburra is really important because Aboriginals believe, so Indigenous Australians believe, that when you hear the kookaburra's laugh or sound in the morning, it signifies another day of hope. So hope is so important. It's like when you wake up, oh, God has blessed me with one more day. It's hope. It's a constant reminder. And there's one other very common Australian sound that is actually not a good sound, and it's the sound of a bushfire. So here in the, in the US, you guys call them forest fires. We call them bushfires. It's the same sort of deal. And these happen pretty regularly. And in 2009, it was the worst bushfire that Australia has ever seen. And it ravaged my home state of Victoria. And the really eerie thing is that the firefighters would be battling these fires for a good week. And that you'd wake up in the morning and you would just hear nothing. There'd be this eerie silence. There'd be stress, sadness, anxiety, borderline depression, because people were thinking, what's happening? Until one day, we woke up and we heard the sound of a kookaburra. We heard the sound of hope. Hope had returned once again. And I don't know what, what your Black Saturday is. I don't know what that thing is in your life that's causing you a lack of hope. I don't know what that thing right now that's draining you. Maybe it's illness in the family, maybe there's sickness, maybe there's financial issues, maybe you have 
some family problems. Maybe you just have general emptiness. Whatever it is, we all need hope. Because one thing I realized is this, that we cannot what? Cope without hope. And this is something that is so across the board. It's not unique. It's across the board. So at the moment, we're on the tail end of our believed discipleship journey. In each, each of these weeks, we're going to talk about, we'll go through 10 key beliefs. We've done that. We've done 10 key practices. And now we're going through the 10 key virtues. And on the door to my left, we have the door that has the key statement on it. And when we walk through that door, when we unlock that door, it helps us understand who God intended us to be. So you probably uh, had a guess already that this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about hope. Because hope eludes so many of us. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. If you have your Believe book, it's on page 401. And if you have the ZCC app, please go to the message notes section to get the most out of our time. So the question that almost everyone asks, if not everybody, is this. How do I deal with the hardships and struggles in life? Who here has hardships and struggles? Who's had them before? Yeah, right? So how do you, how do you adapt to that? So this brings me to our key idea. Who's remembered the key statement? Do you want to say it with me? Ready? One, two, three. I can cope with the hardships of life because of my hope in Jesus Christ. So to be on the screen, let's all say it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. I can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. That right there is the hope in Jesus Christ. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit more about the wrong kinds of hope because we find hope in the wrong things. And I call this false hope. We try and latch on to things that try and give us purpose and meaning, and they can leave us feeling empty. So the first false hope that so many of us fall into is riches. Riches. So many times we think, hey, all the money in the world is going to help us. We think to ourselves, if only I got that another thousand dollars, my life would be good. But it rarely happens really happens. And this is in fact what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, his protege. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. If you're putting your hope in money, in that security, it's fleeting. And in fact, the great theologian of our time, Jim Carrey, this is what he says. Jim Carrey says, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. This is a guy, yeah, right? This is a guy who has a net worth of $180 million. It's never going to be enough. If you're putting your hope in money, in security, it's never going to be enough. Maybe like, okay, Luke, yeah, that's kind of me, but sure, what else you got? Are you putting your hope, your false hope, in people? In people. Maybe you're like, hey, you know what, I, uh, I've got my, um, my romantic partner, I'm going to put all my hope in them, that they know what's best for me. Hey, I've got, you know, family members, I've got friends, I'm going to put all my hope in those people for my direction, for my future. Who here has had friendships implode? Yeah, over really silly stuff, right? I once lost a friendship over a bag of apples. <laughs> Ask me about it later in the lobby and I'll tell you all about it. But if you put 
your hope in people. People will let you down. In fact, the Apostle Paul faced this very thing. Paul was going from city to city, town to town, country to country, and he was proclaiming the faith, and he was under absolute risk of getting martyred any single day. And this is what he says to Timothy. He says this, he says, Do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world and has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now you might think, okay, who's Demas? Demas was a person who was with Paul who was training under Paul and doing the same work, the same mission work that Paul was doing. And what happened is Demas got cold feet. He's like, oh, actually, you know what? Uh, This is kind of dangerous. Paul's getting jailed. He's being shipwrecked. He's getting beaten. He's always hungry. I don't want this anymore. So Demas just got up and left Paul to himself. So Paul knew what it was like to put his faith in people. You can't do it. If you do it, people will let you down. Now, hear me right, okay? I'm not saying don't trust anybody. Don't hear me out. Don't say, oh, I can't trust you because Pastor Luke said I shouldn't trust you. (laughs) Don't do that, all right? I don't want those emails tomorrow. But I'm just saying that have friendships, have relationships, all good. But don't put your entire hope in those people. Maybe you're putting your hope in stuff, in things, in things of this world. Maybe you want that that greatest car. You're like, oh, you know what? I really want that BMW. I drive a BMW, but you know, it's it's different. (laughs) Maybe you want that big house. You're like, oh, you know what? My house, it's only three bedrooms. I really want five. I want to really make a statement to the neighbors. What stuff are you putting your hope in that will make you fulfilled? Even the, the, the prophet Habakkuk says these words. He says, of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? And you might think, hey, I don't, I don't have idols. I don't have little carved images of God that I worship. Well, we all do. Whatever takes priority in your mind is your idol. And in fact, I've got a friend, I won't say who he is, because he could be watching, but um, my brother Jonathan. um, (laughs) Hey, Jonathan. We're all good, bro. So he's one of these guys, okay, I love him, don't get me wrong, but he's one of these guys that really is obsessed with Apple products, okay? I love Apple products too, but he takes it to a whole new level. It's borderline clinical, okay? So he's one of these guys that does this. Okay, so if there's a new iPhone coming out, he will line up overnight and he'll be like, oh, I've got to get that new iPhone. Oh, it's so good. I'm like, okay, what's different? Oh, there's like one more megapixel and they have, they have different colours. Okay, and I'm not saying he puts his hope in that because my brother, you know, is, is a believer, which is fantastic. But so many of us put our faith and our hope in things that they will give us meaning. And in fact, Apple markets its products this way. They don't say, hey, get this phone, it's got a really good camera or it's got a really good processor. They don't. They focus on the human aspect. Get this, it'll make you more connected with people, right? Get this, it'll make you belong more to people. People will like you more. And they do it because it appeals to our innermost being that we all hope for something. Does that make sense? We all hope for stuff, but don't put your whole hope in that. And lastly, maybe you're putting your hope in the government. Now, I'm not going to get into... um, I am not getting into this. I said I wouldn't. People in power, so often things go wrong in our world. Yesterday was a great example of that. When we see nation rise up against nation, well, Iran and Israel are in this, day, in this circumstance. We're like, What's, what are they going to do? What are the people in power going to do? I'm going to put my hope in them. And all we're thinking, hey, only if this person was in power, this wouldn't be happening. And you know what? Conversation for later. But if you put your hope in a government, 
It's misplaced. We've seen people put their hopes in governments before and they've, they've, they've risen and they've fallen. Like my home country of Australia, the government has done some pretty horrible things to its people the last three or four years. Don't put your hope in the government. In fact, Isaiah says these words. He says this, he says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. The Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. And the interesting about, thing about this passage is why it matters is because he was talking to the people of Judah. And the people of Judah were enslaved by the Egyptians for years and years and years. And when, when hardship and troubles came they, their way, what did they do? They didn't say, hey, God, help us. We need your mercy. We need you. They said, oh, let's go to Egypt. They've got the biggest and the baddest government. Let's look to people. They almost forgot that they were enslaved by those, that very country. The fact is, if you put your hope in a government, it's going to leave you feeling hopeless. And you might be thinking, okay, Luke, maybe I'm guilty of one of those four things, maybe all of them. Maybe there's one on the list that you didn't name. But what is, what is true hope? Well, according to our key statement, true hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. He is timeless. He wants the best for you. And there was a guy in the, in the Bible, Paul, I mentioned him before. This is a guy who did the missional work of Jesus after Jesus went to heaven. And he faced every day of going hungry, being thirsty. He was jailed. He was beaten. He was regularly persecuted for his faith. And compare your troubles to that. They don't seem so bad. But Paul, who had every reason and every excuse to not be happy with God and say, God, where are you? You have forsaken me. I have no hope. This is what Paul says. He says these words in 2 Corinthians. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Get this part. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is what? But what is unseen is? Paul had perspective. Paul knew that what he was going through was only going to be fleeting. He knew as bad as things would get, he kept his eyes focused on Jesus. He kept his eyes focused on eternity. I want us to do just a really, really quick activity, okay? Whether you're taking notes in the app or you're taking notes on your phone or a notepad, or even do this mentally, I want each and every one of us to list the three biggest hardships and struggles in your life right now. Even just think about them. Could be anything. And as you write those down, I want you to write down this sentence underneath in bold letters. Underline it, do whatever you want to do. Highlight it, make it colours, I don't care, whatever. These words. An eternal glory far outweighs them all. No matter what you're going through, no matter the hardships, no matter the struggles, no matter the things that are sucking your hope away, no matter the amount of things that leave you feeling hopeless and empty, there is an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And that glory is waiting for each and every single one of you. So we have this idea of hope. And in the, um, in the Old Testament, we hear stories and stories of, of heroes of the faith, we call them. It's people like Abraham and, and Isaac and Noah and Jacob and all these amazing people. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for this Saviour to come and save them from their sin. And this is what the writer of Hebrews says. He says this, 
all these people were still living by faith when they died. When they did not, they did not receive the things promised, which was Jesus the Messiah, right? They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners. I get that. And strangers on earth. So these hearers of the faith, these people who were waiting for Jesus, they had this hope of Jesus. They had this hope of glory, and they died with that hope. I don't know about you, but my hope can go like this, right? We can be pushed aside so easily and so quickly. And we have to have that hope that we are called to have. And... The promises are important to remember. Promises that offer us belonging, connection, direction, but most of all, eternal life. They're the promises that God makes us if we put our faith in Jesus. And now we're like, okay, well, what's the second point? Well, the second point is we have to believe the one making the what? Making the promises. Is Jesus reliable? Maybe you've put your faith in him once upon a time. You've put your hope in him. Maybe you're, you've been praying, Jesus, I'm going to put my hope in you. I'm going to put my faith in you right now. Change this tomorrow, right? We put our timeline on God. Who's done that? I've done it. And then we get frustrated and annoyed that he doesn't work in our time. But he always works in the perfect time. Every single time. Maybe you've never put your hope in Jesus. Maybe you're like, you know what, this Jesus stuff is pretty new to me. What does it mean? It means the hope that we're all hardwired to have should be placed in Jesus because he will never let you down. He will never, ever leave you wanting. Ever. And this is what it comes down to, folks. This. Our hope is in Jesus alone. It's not in any of the other stuff. Alone. I don't know about you, but that is something that I want to hold on to. I've gone through life. I'm only 40, but I've gone through life. And someone like, that's really old. Like my students, I feel so old in front of my students. Some are like, that's really young. But I've gone through life putting my hope in the wrong things. You name it, I've done it. Stuff, absolutely. Relationships, you bet. Government, yep, done that. But the moment I put my hope in Jesus, the moment I recalibrate myself, that's where my hope is planted. In the, uh, in the Old Testament, we had these, um, that the Jewish people, they put their hope in sacrifices. They put their hope in the law. They put their hope in the wrong things. And we're going to find out in a second just what that means. But before we do that, I, um, I used to go fishing with my uncle. The first time I ever did it, I mean, I was like eight and my uncle made me watch the movie Jaws the night before. <laughs> and if you know anything about Australia, literally everything wants to kill you. <laughs> so here I was thinking, you know what? <laughs> There's a shark, like every square metre or every square foot for you guys. There is like a shark. And I'm like, I'm like just, you know, Peter, just keep going, keep going. Because as long as we can outrun the shark, that's all that matters. <laughs> all right? We're on a speedboat, it's great. And what happened? He's like, okay. <sighs> this is good. And he stopped the boat. I'm like, what are you doing? We're going to die. He's like, we, we want to fish. And then he pulled out this thing. So who knows what this is? An anchor. Now, it's not real. That wouldn't do much by itself. But an anchor. And I said, what's that all about? What's an anchor for? You know, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty young. And he said, well, an anchor serves two purposes. The first thing an anchor does is it stops you. I'm like, well, obviously, I'm going to die. But he said, no matter what's happening with the storms on the sea, 
no matter how rough it is, no matter what the currents are doing underneath the water, this is going to keep you steady and firm and safe. And I was doubting the safe part, but it's true. I was safe on the water. And then he said, Luke, it does one other thing. He said, when you anchor this down to the floor, what happens is you have an equilibrium. You can see the horizon perfectly. And it stays that way. So you can see what's coming ahead. And I thought, well, this is, this is pretty cool. So anchors are, are a good thing if they're used correctly. And this reminds me, we all need to have an anchor in our lives that we drop every now and again and say, hey, I'm going to put my hope, I'm going to drop everything down there, no matter what's happening around me, no matter what the storms of the seas are doing, no matter what the storms in the sky are doing, no matter what the current is happening, I want to stay still and I want to see you, Jesus. And in fact, the writer of Hebrews says these words. He says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. So can we go back to the last slide, please, Larissa? Okay. Who saw that verse? That's your memory verse. Who, do you want to say it out loud together? One, two, three. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the innermost so the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has gone on our behalf. So do you remember what I said before about the, the people putting the uh, sacrifices and their hope in sacrifices? This is important. This matters because the way this would be done is there'd be a temple and there'd be a room called the Holy of Holies, which is the one room where God was, right? And Separating this room wasn't a door, it was this big, heavy curtain or veil. And this was because, well, you know, we can't approach God, but there was a very physical and metaphoric barrier between us and God. We could not approach God because of our sin, of, of what we have done. So when Jesus died, it says he, he was the forerunner, he went before us. When Jesus died, when Jesus gave up his spirit, the veil was torn in two. The veil, the curtain, was gone. And this matters because we now have access to God. We didn't have it before. We didn't need to sacrifice every year anymore. We have access to God. And we can anchor our hope in his promises and what he has said. I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty excited. I was raised in the church. My parents were in church leadership, and I was playing church for so many years. I came to church every single week. I came to youth group every week. I knew, it, I knew the Bible verses, you name it, but it wasn't in here. My hope was anchored elsewhere. And what happened is, my dad was going through a court case and the possibility was he could go to jail. And I was 15. And I'm like, God, okay, I've tried everything else. I'm going to come to you as a last resort. Please keep my dad out of jail. Please, I'll do anything. I'll do, I'll do whatever you want. I was bargaining with God. We've done that, right? My hope was in desperation. My hope was that God would get my dad out of jail. So I prayed, and then the court case came around. I'm like, you know what? God's got this. The one time I was spiritual in my whole life. And my dad went to jail for 21 months. I was like, God, how dare you? I started putting my hope in other things again. I forgot God. And what happened when I was 16, Easter camp, 2000, or 16, I'm so do the math, you know how old I am. Oh, my, my mum was like, you know what, Luke? Prison Fellowship is organising you and your brother Adam to go to a camp. I'm like, oh, cool! It's a Christian camp. Oh, what? I don't want to do that. But they, you know, my mum forced me to go. She put me in the car. She physically put me in the car. 
She did. Good on your mum. So I was, um, I'm like, you know, fine, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to show my age now. I was sitting in the car thinking, I'm just going to be on my Discman. Who knows where a Discman is? Anyone under the age of 40 knows where a Discman is? And I was going to call my girlfriend on a payphone <laughs> with cash. But what happened that night, I was sort of listening to, to what the, what the uh, youth pastor was saying, and he was talking about hope. And I'm like, you know what? I've heard about Jesus a million times. I've heard about the sin stuff a million times. But you're talking about hope now. That's what I want. That's what I want. The hope that I was placing in other things was failing, and I finally admitted it. And before I knew it, I was up the front and I was worshipping Jesus. Because the hope that he offers me, not just in life, but in eternity, I don't know about you, but that is what I want. That's what I need, and that's what we all need. Amen? So I'm going to ask one really simple question. And I would love you to be honest with yourselves, if not anybody else. And that is this. Where are you anchoring your hope? Maybe it's one of the four. Maybe it's money. Maybe you want that security. Maybe it's stuff. You want the latest and greatest thing that's going to fill that void in your life, but you know it's not because you want something else. Maybe it's people. Maybe you've got your hope in that other person who you're like, you know what, they're never going to fail me, and they just might. Or maybe you're putting your hope in government. It could be any or all those things or none of them. Whatever it is, he offers you that hope this morning. And maybe... Just maybe you've heard this before. Yeah, Luke, I've heard it before. Maybe you're like me as that 16-year-old kid. I know it, I know it. Yeah, I know it, I know it. What's for lunch? I know it, I know it. But I'm going to challenge you just to pause and be still before God and ask yourself, where am I placing my hope in and can I place my hope in Jesus? I really hope you can because he satisfies Maybe you, this is the first time you've ever heard this stuff. And you're like, yeah, I want that hope that, that Luke's talking about. I want that. I want that hope. How do I do it? It's pretty easy. We're about to do it in a second. But the fact is, no matter where you are, whether you're here or at home, you can say yes to Jesus. You can say, yes, I want that hope that you offer. What's happening right now is not working, but I want what you're offering, Jesus. If that's you, I would love to lead you in a prayer. Now, respond in your own way. And I really want to challenge you to step out of that. Pull whatever anchors you have down right now that aren't doing a thing in your life and place your anchor in Christ. So we're going to pray together. And um, let's, let's, let's bow our heads. God, we uh, thank you so much that you offer us a hope that truly suffices, a hope that no one can give, nothing can give. Lord, you know where each one of us are here, whether we're here or at home. You know what's in the depth of our heart. You know where we're anchoring our hope. Lord, whether we're hearing this for the first time or we've heard it all before. God, we pray that we can all come to the foot of the cross to one place and acknowledge that we need the hope that only you offer. Lord, in a hopeless world, we thank you for your hope. Now, with every eye still closed, if you want that hope for the first time or you're coming back to it again, I would love you to raise your hand if that's you. That's you. Amen. I see you. Fantastic. Yep. Great. Awesome. If you want this hope that he offers. Great. Lord, we uh, thank you for those people who have been courageous and raised their hands. Lord, we acknowledge that it can be tough to do at times. But Lord, we want to lean into the hope that you offer us, the hope that no one else can bring us. Lord, we uh, pray for those that raised their hands, and maybe those that didn't raise their hands but still want this hope. Lord, we pray 
that they can experience you in a very real way. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We love you in your name. Amen. If you put, yeah. <laughs> Guys, if you are, if that's you, and you, you said, yes, I want to put my hope in Jesus, whether you put your hand up or whether you're just like, you know what, I want to do that, but I don't want to do this, that's, that's, that's okay. I want to encourage you to, to get your phones and text the word Z yes to 77411. If you're at home right now online, go to the zcc.live website and click on the big orange button that says yes, we'd love to connect with you. If you're in here, we have some people around as well who have some, some, some cards for you. Please text the number on that as well. They'll be out in the information uh, hub as well. So guys, if that's you, we want to really, really encourage you to keep the hope that Jesus has before us. So with that being said, let's going to open this door and unlock the truth for this week. Are we ready? All right, let's say it all together. Ready? One, two, three. I can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope I have in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you have. God, we pray that as we continue now our worship through song, Lord, that these aren't just words that we sing from our voices, but they're the depths of our heart, the cries that are deep down. Lord, you know the lack of hope that some of us might have here. Whether we're here or at home, God, you know where we're at. Give us the hope that only you could offer. Help us to walk through that door and to unlock the truth that we can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope that you offer us. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In your name, everyone said, Amen. Amen.